اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك ورسولك محمد أفضل الخلق وأكرم الرسل أرض اللهم ارض عن الصحابة أجمعين وارض عنا معهم يا كريم We commence in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise him, we thank him upon all conditions we send complete blessings and salutations upon the best of creation, the most noble of all messengers, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him, his household, his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all those in the chain of the people who brought the goodness to us from that time up to now. May Allah bless them all. If it was not for their effort, we would not have had the goodness today. So it is our duty and responsibility to pray for all of those whom we know, whom we do not know, who have struggled and strived over the generations in order to preserve the beautiful teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given to us through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They learnt it. They put it into practice and they conveyed it to the next generation in a way that it got to us. Now it is our duty to learn it, to put it into practice and to convey it to the next generation so that when we are gone, when they say Rahmatullahi alayhim, then definitely we will be included in that. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every one of us too and to bless our offspring, those to come up to Qiyamah. May Allah keep us steadfast on the deen and make us from among those who can please Him at all times. My brothers, my sisters, honorable dignitaries, and one and all, those who are listening now, those who may listen later on, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed grant us the softening of the heart. When a heart is softened, it is ready to accept. When it is softened towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is ready to accept, it is ready to change. Many of us, myself included, we have some bad habits sometimes. Some are serious, some are not very serious. Some people have bad habits that go beyond the level of being acceptable. And some people, it does not affect others, but it is a personal bad habit. We are human beings. It is only normal and natural that we will have imperfections. But the struggle towards perfection shall remain up to the day we die so that we please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, it's up to us to give up some of the bad habits. I've been speaking in the last few days in your beautiful country of Malaysia. May Allah preserve it. May Allah protect it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you peace, stability, security. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with you. Ameen. And I have said over the last few days that it is important for us to develop ourselves. It's not good enough for us to lose ourselves. We have rules and regulations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala governing how we should behave and to remind one another about these duties is an act of charity. It is an act of charity. We speak about Islam being the religion of kindness, Islam being the religion of benevolence. It commences with knowledge because without knowledge, we won't know what is kindness. We won't know what is benevolence. We won't know what is goodness because we have not learned. When a person does not learn, how would they know what is halal, what is haram? How would they know what is good, what is bad? If they have not learned. If a child does not know what a snake is, the child might innocently walk towards the snake and start playing with that snake without realizing that this is a dangerous reptile or a serpent. And the child may be harmed. But if the child were to know from a young age that be careful of this particular creature, then the child would be able to cry for help once a snake comes in its presence. That is obviously a tough example. 
But the reason I gave this example, my brothers and sisters, is to show you that without knowing what is right and wrong, we may fall into that which is wrong. And we may lose the opportunity to engage in what is correct. So this is why in the Arabic language, there is a beautiful saying, عَرَفْتُ الشَّرَّ لِأُوَقِّيهِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفِ الشَّرَّ يَقَعْ فِيهِ عَرَفْتُ الشَّرَّ لِأُوَقِّيهِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفِ الشَّرَّ يَقَعْ فِيهِ I have learned or I have known what evil is so that I can stay away from it. Because the one who does not know what evil is will fall straight into it. Subhanallah. I learned that there is a hole here. This road is not good. You know when you are driving with your vehicle, mashallah, you have beautiful roads in Kota Kinabalu. I come from Zimbabwe. Our roads are not as grand as yours. When we are driving, we know on this road, at this place, there is a pothole. On this road, the other place, there is a hump. On that road, this, this place here, the road is actually very bad. You need to slow down and stop. So a person who does not know what happens to them is, they bash straight through these holes and they destroy their motor vehicle. What's the point of buying a beautiful Valfire and you don't know that the road ahead of you is going to destroy your car? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So we have the path, the path leading to Jannah. I want Jannah, you want Jannah and inshallah by the mercy of Allah we will be in Jannah. Say Ameen. Ameen. May Allah make us meet there. You know when I saw Kota Kinabalu from the air and I landed here. I put it on Instagram. I put it on social media saying, mashallah, beautiful place. You know, it looks a little bit, people say, it looks a little bit like Jannah. And I said, subhanallah, if this is the beauty of the dunya, I'm sure Allah has something much better in store. Because Jannah, Allah describes it. You know what He says? فِيهَا مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذْنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ And in the Quran, Allah says, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٌ We have for you in paradise anything that they would wish which means it is actually in third person for them is whatever they wish in Jannah and we have something extra more than what they wish imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you what do you want and you have your list you draw your whole list of things and after that he says anything else so you think and think and you draw another list and you give it to him and then he says, anything else? You say, no, that's okay. So he will say, you take that and I will give you more and more and more and more. I quickly want to make mention of this. It's very interesting. This evening we have a lot of time. I was told to speak for long. Is that true? Okay. So I can quickly make mention of this. You see, my brothers and sisters, we are all here to be inspired. We all want to feel good Muslims. We all want to go back with a powerful message. We all want to change our lives in a positive way, even if it means by one centimeter, inshallah. So let's talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. Allah says, and this is through the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that... In Jannah, there is that which no eye has ever seen, no ears have ever heard, and no mind has ever thought of. No one has ever thought of it. So if you have seen something beautiful, you need to know in Jannah is way beyond that. If you have heard about something really amazing, you need to know in Jannah is way beyond that. If you have thought about something you need to know in Jannah is better than that. That's Jannah to Firdaus. So the worst person, the hadith says, the last person to enter Jannah. Now what that means is, some people will enter ma'al kiramil barara, ma'al nabiyyina, was siddiqina, was shuhada'i, was salihin. Some people will enter Jannah to Firdaus with the prophets and with the pious, and with those who were close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will just go in. May Allah make us from those, through His mercy. Ameen. Don't be lazy to say Ameen. 
It costs you nothing and it can get you straight into Jannah. I promise you. So my brothers and sisters, some will go to Jannah very quickly. Some they will go a little bit later. Some they will have to pay for their bad deeds in Jahannam, in hellfire first. When they are clean, then they will have to go to Jannah to Firdaus. So the last one to get out of Jahannam and to go into Jannah, there is a beautiful narration which makes mention of when he comes out, he is so happy. And he says, you know what? If I were to come out of this Jahannam and I were to be just outside Jahannam, I'm a happy man. So Allah takes him out and puts him just out. And a little while later, he sees a tree. He sees a tree at a distance. And he thinks, he says, you know what? Oh Allah, he already promised that if I were to be taken out, there's nothing more I want. So he was taken out. He was not supposed to want anything else. But you know the nature of man. Man is such, wallahi, I tell you, ask the businessmen and women here. That if, when they started up, they told themselves, when I earn the first 100,000 ringgit, that's it, I'm going to retire. When 100,000 came, they wanted 1 million. When a million came, they wanted a billion. When a billion came, I don't know what happened, but it will not stop. So man is like that. So this man, he says, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to ask you one more thing. The last thing. I just want to go to this tree. You see there is a shade there. I just need to go near this tree here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Okay, after that would you ask for anything? He says, No. That's the last thing. So he's taken to the tree. And after that, he's, he's thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gets a scent. There is a smell. A smell of what? Coming from Jannah to Firdaus. Because he's not yet inside Jannah, but he's out of Jahannam. So he says, Oh Allah, if you take me closer to the scent, I will really be thankful. And Allah says, But weren't you the one who said this is okay? Anyway, through my mercy, I will give you that. He gets there and he sees the door of Jannah from a distance. He says, Oh Allah, take me close to that door. Last thing, that's it. Last thing, close to the door. And that happens. And that after that, he says, Oh Allah, just inside the door, just inside the door, you know, right inside the door. That's man, subhanallah, inside. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh my worshipper, oh my worshipper, I want to ask you one thing. If I were to give you, now who are we talking about? The last one to come out of hellfire, to go to Jahannam. So we all who are seated here, maybe it can be us if we are the worst. But it would probably be someone worse than us. We would be better than that, inshallah. Why do I say this? Because this hadith says that is the last person. So it has to be one person. The others are all in front of him. So inshallah, we will all be in front. Have hope. May Allah make us even better. So Allah tells this last person that, you know what? If I were to give you whatever the whole dunya, the dunya meaning this world, whatever the whole world had, would you be happy? Now think about it for a moment. What does the world have? It has everything in it. It's got gold and silver and whatnot all inside. All yours. Everything yours. Whatever it has, all yours. Just for you. Only you. So he says, for me? Imagine now he, he is going to be offered something grand. And then he says, okay, ya Allah, I will take that. And I will be happy with it. And Allah says, you can have that وَمِثْلُهُ 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 عَشَرَ مَرَّاتِ You can have that multiplied, multiplied, multiplied ten times only for you. Subhanallah. This is a powerful narration. I start with this as an introduction to give you hope in the mercy of Allah. Allah is Ghafoor. Allah is Rahim. Allah is Rahman. Allah is most forgiving, Allah is most merciful, Allah is beneficent, Allah is loving, Allah is kind. Allah is looking for any excuse to forgive us. So develop a relationship with Allah. Have your link with Allah. My brothers and sisters, something very serious comes to my mind now. When we commit sin, we do it privately, right? When we do something wrong, we don't want to be exposed. You know, today we have the mobile phone, mashallah. Ever since this smartphone has been invented and it has spread on the earth, we are all journalists. All of us. 
We have become professional photographers. I promise you. Amazing. Everything is recorded when someone is dying. Astaghfirullah. Sometimes the people are busy taking photos instead of helping the person. Astaghfirullah. Someone is drowning. And instead of us going to help, we say, hold on, hold on, quickly, take out my phone. Let me take a picture, picture. Yeah. And when, in the, when later on you sell that to the newspaper, I saw it, I recorded when he died. What? You recorded when he died. Where is your mind? Throw your phone and dive in to help, man. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us good guidance. Because Islam is a religion of kindness, benevolence. We are not selfish. Don't think of your own little five minutes of fame. No. It is five minutes of fame. After that, it will be something else. Think about a life. You save a life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Whoever saves a single life is equivalent to the one or similar to the one or it is as though they have saved humanity at large. So let us work towards that. It is absolutely important for us to realize the value of this. So I was saying we've all become journalists and this is something shocking. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has promised us goodness. And He has promised us that if you do good, I will give you Jannatul Firdaus. Like I said earlier, Allah is Rahman, Allah is Rahim, Allah is most forgiving, Allah is most merciful. Have a good perception of Allah. Because He says in a hadith Qudsi, hadith Qudsi means the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, I will treat every one of my worshippers according to the manner in which they perceive me. In simple English, I will treat everyone how they think I will treat them. So if you think Allah did not forgive me, who knows? That is an insult to Allah. Maybe He won't forgive you. You know, shaitan, when a person commits a sin, shaitan... He does two things. The first thing he does, he does not want you to do tawbah. He does not want you to repent. That's the first thing he does. And if, you, if he fails and you repent, the second thing is, he makes you think that that repentance is not accepted. These are two plans of Allah. Guess which one is worse? Subhanallah. The second is an insult to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves, never ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah. He forgives all your sins. That's what the verse says. So if Allah is saying, never ever lose hope in my mercy, and you are losing hope in His mercy, you are insulting Him. He is telling you, I am forgiving. You say, no, I don't think you are forgiving. What? How can you talk to Allah like that? How can you think about Allah like that? So I want to correct the perception of every one of us. Remember Allah is forgiving no matter what you've done. He will forgive you when you make tawbah. You need to feel with the change within yourself. That oh Allah, I have asked you for forgiveness. I admitted my sin. I regretted it. I sought forgiveness. I promised not to do it again. Those four conditions. Now ya Allah, I am convinced. I am forgiven. It's forgotten and it's in the past. I will not let it bog me down. If you want to repeat the istighfar, seeking of forgiveness, it's important to repeat every day so many times in a good way. But don't think Allah did not forgive you. No, that's a plot of the devil. It's a plot of shaitan. So the sins that are committed by a person, shaitan tries his best. Shaitan tries his best 
to make us lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something we need to be very, very careful of. Don't ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in so many different words in the Quran and in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that indeed if you want to achieve the mercy of Allah, you need to be merciful. You need to be merciful. لا يرحم الله من لا يرحم الناس. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not have mercy upon he or she who is merciless to the rest of mankind. You don't have mercy to mankind. Allah says, "I will not have mercy upon you." So remember this. Today there are people who misinterpret Islam. They want to harm everyone. Any small thing, they want to create a problem. No, remember, do not create problems for indeed you are answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the same way you are answerable to Allah, the others are also answerable to Allah. If a person is committing a sin, you can guide them in a beautiful way. You cannot go and start punching them up and start saying, right, because I saw you in the nightclub, come here, I'm going to whip you. You cannot do that. You can guide them, my brother, my sister, you know, I saw you in the nightclub, that's not a good thing. If they are clever, they will tell you, well, what were you doing in the nightclub? SubhanAllah, that's a good question. You know, one day there was a man, and he came to this gathering, and he was telling everyone that, you know, I went to this wedding of these people, the people were naked. The women were like this. There was big music blasting like it was a nightclub. And there were smoke screens. And the, the groom came in a helicopter. And the, the bride came in a Porsche. And this happened. And there was so much alcohol. And it was haram. Things happening and what, 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 what. So someone said, Uncle, what were you doing there? He was very fast. You know, you know some people are very quick to think. He said, well... I went there to gather information to tell you. That, that's why I went there. If I didn't go there, who was going to inform you about all of this? <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from among those who find excuses. The reason I give you this example is, we are quick to look for excuses for ourselves. Quick, very fast, like this. But for another man or another woman, we won't find any excuse, subhanallah. We will not find an excuse. So let us learn if you want to be saved. This is the plan of Allah. Man satara musliman, satarahu Allahu fi dunya wal ukhra. If you cover the faults of your fellow brothers and sisters, Allah will cover your faults in the dunya and the akhirah. If you love to expose, you shall be exposed. This is why be careful of your phone. Social media has made it easy for us to harm people instead of being kind to them. We, we forward messages without authentication. We actually forward something and we write there, forwarded as received. Have you seen that? Forwarded as received. As though that is an indemnity in front of the angels or in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if I put forwarded as received, I can bash any brother or sister or anyone and I can say what I like and claim, no, I was only forwarding it. Wallahi, go back to the Quran in Surah An-Nur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you don't do that. You don't spread the tales of immorality. You know why? If a person commits adultery, if a person is consuming alcohol, if a person is a gambler, if a person has been caught stealing, if a person, for example, has uh, committed some crime, and we tend to talk about the crime and how it was done and the adultery and what exactly happened and so on and so forth. What happens? In people's minds, when too many of these stories start spreading, their morals, the level of their moral drops automatically. Because they start thinking, well, everyone is doing this. Who am I? I'm just one. I'm a figure. Everyone is doing this, so it's okay. Let me do it. So this is why we are taught to be careful what you spread, even if it is true. You cannot say things. Do you know the meaning of the word riba? Riba means backbiting, right? Backbiting actually means, in fact, the Sahaba, عنهم, they asked Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
He says, do you know what is ghiba? Do you know what is ghiba? They said, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, ذِكْرُكَ أَخَاكَ بِمَا يَكْرَهُ To mention about your brother or your sister, that which had they been present, they would have not liked it. To mention behind their back, that which is true, not false, it's true. But you spoke behind their back in a way that they wouldn't have liked it. It is true. So the Sahaba anhum asked him, what if, what if it is really true? You know, some people say when they are backbiting and someone says don't backbite, the excuse they use, they say, no, 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 I'm telling you the truth. Telling me the truth, well then that is backbiting. That is exactly what backbiting is. The Prophet says, In kana fihi ma taqulu faqadirtabta. If if the person has in it what you are saying, which means it's true, then it's backbiting. If it is a lie, then it is a fabrication, it is a slander, it is a buhtan. That's what it is. So if you go back to the Surah An Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. لولا إذ سمعتموه قلتم ما يكون لنا أن نتكلم بهذا سبحانك هذا بهتان عظيم. The true believers are those whom, when they hear a dirty story about someone else, they say we should not be talking about this. This is a lie. Leave it. That's the first response of a true believer. Today, the world has changed. When you hear something, you know what people say? Ooh, I wouldn't put it past anyone. That's what they say. I wouldn't put it past anyone. Why don't you have a good feeling so that when you have the, the rumors spread against you, other people will defend you. They will say, you know what? I don't think that this person could have had this because they are not worth doing that. For example, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stood up to defend Aisha radiallahu anha. They were, uh, they were accusing her. They were spreading rumor about her, saying that she was immoral. Astaghfirullah. Allah cleared her name in the Quran. And Allah makes mention of people like Abu Ayyub al-Ansari by saying, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالُوا هَذَا إِثْمٌ مُبِينٌ سبحان الله إِفْكٌ مُبِينٌ إِفْك actually means a lie, a fabrication. So this verse means had you as believers Subhanallah, had you as believers, when you heard the tale or the accusation, thought good by comparing it with yourselves and saying, if we cannot do it, she definitely did not do it. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, when the wife said, did you hear what they are saying? Did you hear what they are saying about Aisha? Immediately he said, look, would you ever do something like that? She said, no. I would never do it. He said, well, Aisha is purer than you. Done. The story is closed. How many of us are ready to defend others? That is the kindness of Islam. Learn to speak good about people. Learn to say good about people behind their backs. And you will find in an amazing way, people will talk good about you behind your back. The problem with us behind backs, we talk bad. In front, we smile. Ah, Assalamu alaikum. You know, when there is a smile that goes right from ear to ear, sometimes something is wrong, you know. Especially person who you know there is something, ah, like you're a long lost friend, you know. And they come and they, subhanallah. They, it's a different thing if they are genuinely your friend and you know them. But sometimes people who you know, hey, this person here, you know, they are... A little bit dilly dally. Look at how they are greeting like I'm a long lost buddy. Be careful. Subhanallah. It is better for me to have someone tell me on my face. Look brother. Look my sister. This is not a good idea. I heard this, heard that. I'm not going to tell the people. I'm going to tell you. You know in the houses. I don't know the system here in Kota Kinabalu. It's a beautiful name. I'm going to say it a few times in the lecture. The last time I came I didn't know how to pronounce it properly. So this time I learned, you know, before I came, I repeated it a few times, mashallah. 
I even know that uh, if you don't know how to say it, just say KK and it's okay. Uh, subhanallah. So, sometimes in the home, the issues we have, unnecessary. You know, a man gets married. Okay? When he gets married, what happens? His mother feels that, you know, this man is now going to another woman and he's going to his wife. Not realizing that the love is different. The love you have for your mother, the love you have for your wife, two totally different loves, right? But the mother feels it sometimes, you know, now he's not coming home, now he doesn't eat here, now he doesn't ask about me, he doesn't visit me, and so on. So who does she blame? She cannot blame her beloved son, she blames the wife. It's, a, it's true, it happens. So then she says, you know, your wife has taken you away from me. No, the wife will be sitting saying, you are coming to me, what can I do? Subhanallah. So it creates sometimes small form of friction. Friction, a little bit of friction. Wallahi, one of the solutions of this is to praise your mother-in-law or your daughter-in-law behind their backs, whether you like it or not. When you go to sit with your friends, you must say, my daughter-in-law is a very good girl. She looks after my son. She's a nice person. She speaks well. She is pleasant. Say nice things. If you have a problem, call her. Call your son. Say it to them only. That is Islam. You are being kind. This is actually benevolence in your home. When we talk of kindness, we only think that it is monetary. We don't realize in Islam so many points of goodness. Allah says, Sadaqa for a smile. Do you know that? Tabassumuka fi wajhi akhika. Sadaqa. You heard the hadith? To smile in the face of your brethren is actually an act of charity. Normally the word sadaqah is used if someone says, can you give a sadaqah? What are they talking about? Money. But Allah says, no, more important than your money is your character and your attitude. Because if you have an attitude, we don't even want your money. We don't want your money. Imagine a person gives you a thousand ringgits as a poor person, but he swears you abuse it. You tell him, hey brother, keep your thousand. Keep it. I don't want it. Subhanallah. Someone does you a favor and every day they tell you, you know, I did you the favor. You know, I did you. The... It happened to me once. It happened to me. There was a brother who did a favor to me many years ago. And he kept on reminding me and he kept on telling me, you know what I did? I said, brother, please, let's calculate what you've done for me and I'll pay you back in cash. Stop it. Because that's not a favor. That is actually something bad. So, you see, when it comes to in-laws, there's nothing wrong. We make it wrong. Imagine if you were to praise your in-laws, like I said, your daughter-in-law or your mother-in-law. You know, why don't we talk about fathers-in-law and sons-in-law? Why is it always mother-in-law, daughter-in-law? Subhanallah. You know, it reminds me of uh, something on a light note. They say, some of you may have heard this if you heard the live stream a few days ago. They say, a father becomes a father-in-law, okay? A son becomes a son-in-law. The mother becomes a mother-in-law. The daughter becomes a daughter-in-law. The wife, she is the law. That's the thing. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. That's why they use the word law. Have you ever thought of it? What is it to do with law in marriage? What is it? There's no connection. I've always been asking people, where does the law come in? Now I understand it's the wife. That's the law, you know. So, and I always say, we are supposed to be, you know, you marry your wife. You're in love with your wife. It's supposed to be love. That's the mother of my love. That's the father of my love. So she is my mother in love. She, he is my father in love. Why do we say law? It's supposed to be mother-in-love. So inshallah from now, we will say, that's my mother-in-love. Subhanallah. <laughs> May Allah increase our love. Say Amen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us harmony in our homes. Why am I saying all of this? Because charity begins at home. That's why I'm saying this. Charity begins at home. It's not good enough for us to talk about how to be kind to the rest of the world when we are brutally misbehaving in our own homes, abusive, 
The way we use our mouth, we, the worst words come out for our children, our wives, sometimes our husbands, sometimes our family members, our children, our parents, our parents. Sometimes the worst words possible come out. And when someone knocks the door, Salamu alaikum, my brother, how are you? Uh, that attitude, you should have had it before you opened the door. Subhanallah, it's a reality. What's the point of the whole world thinking that you are a top person when your family says you are a rotten individual? May Allah forgive us. That is the reason why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he said the best from amongst you, what did he say? Is who? Who? The best to your family, the best to your wife. Why? Because your wife sees you when you are happy, when you are sad. When you are okay, when you are not okay. When you are healthy, when you are feeling sick. 24-7, she sees you. She knows you. She knows everything about you. You have shown her exactly who you are. Because you live with her too. You cannot hide. But when you go to work, you're only going for a few hours. Ah, how are you? Ah, what's going on? You know, you are smart. Everything neat. You don't know the food was brought from home. Or I'm going to eat some. It's a different environment. If someone sees you a few hours a day, they really don't know you. They only see what you show them. When they live with you, yes, they know you. With those who live with you the most are your family. When they say that you are a good person, trust me, you are a really good person. If your wife or your husband has to say, Wallahi, I have a beautiful spouse, really lovely person. How long are you married for? 17 years, 20 years. Wallahi, I'm married to someone who's, Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah. Do you think they can be lying? Do you really think that that person can be evil? No, they know because they live with you. But if you just see someone on a daily basis for a little while, you met them, you greeted them, Salaamu Alaikum. These are pleasantries. It's easy to show a face, you know. It's easy. So this is why we say charity begins at home. Make sure before you leave your house every day, you have given out charities by saying a good word, by smiling, by showing a good expression on your face. Today we are depressed because everyone is gloomy. We're looking at our phones, everyone. Every, the whole house is on the phone. The whole house is on the phone. Turn off the Wi-Fi. Put the phone aside. I have a new rule in my house. New rule. What is it? Food. The phone is not on the table. Leave it out. Otherwise, you're not going to eat. I promise you. Do you know why? That table and the table manners and the bonding that happens on the table with you, your spouse, your children is priceless. It is worth thousands of ringgits, trust me. To have a meal with your family, without distraction. You look at your children, you talk to them, they talk to you about their day, there is interaction. No one is busy with their phones or anything else, no. I know sometimes one or two of the children in a rush, they will quickly eat fast and go back to the phone. But you know what? When they are on the table, there must not be a phone there, no distraction. Eat, say the name of Allah. A lot of us, if we could, we would eat with one hand, one hand the phone and one hand we're just eating. Uh, Wallahi, that's, that's where we are today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. So we need to change this. We need to change it in a beautiful way. When we want to correct things in a lovely way, a sweet way. Like we would like to be corrected nicely, correct others also in a nice way. So, like I said, charity begins at home. Thereafter, my brothers and sisters, those who work for us, remember to be kind to them. إِخْوَانُكُمْ خَوَلُكُمْ جَعَلَهُمُ اللَّهُ تَحْتَ أَيْدِيكُمْ فَمَنْ كَانَ أَخُوهُ تَحْتَ يَدِهِ فَلْيُطْعِمُهُ مِمَّا يَأْكُلْ وَلْيُلْبِسْهُ مِمَّا يَلْبَسْ وَلَا تُكَلِّفُوهُمْ مَا يُغْلِبُهُمْ فَإِنْ كَلَّفْتُمُوهُمْ فَأَعِينُوهُمْ Amazing. These servants who are serving you, these people who work for you, these people who are below you because they are serving you. The hadith says, Allah has put them beneath you in authority. But they are your brothers. They are your sisters. If Allah wants, He can change the table. In the next generation or two or three generations down, their children will be the bosses of your children. It will happen, it can happen, and it has happened. 
وتلك الأيام نداولها بين الناس The days, Allah says, we rotate them around for the people. The one who is ruling will be the ruled and, the, and, and vice versa. Over generations, things have to change. The rich become poor, the poor become rich. Allah says, that's my plan on earth. It will not remain the same. People will get a chance for everything. But it's a matter of generations. It's up to Allah. Therefore, treat people with respect. I have known of people who were cobblers before for a nation and they became rulers, subhanallah, later on. It's amazing. So be careful. When you treat someone well, the day he gets a big position, you know what happens? He will treat you well. It was all to do with respect. You were good. That's it. The same applies to wealth. When you have wealth, Allah says, we will rotate it. You will not remain wealthy forever. So therefore, be kind. When you have, give. So that when you don't have, you shall be given. And it's not like we are waiting for handouts. But what we mean is, people will acknowledge there is kindness. The best person, the best person is he who has authority, he who has wealth, and he who has the best character and conduct after Iman and Taqwa. That's the best person. When you see a man, you know he is powerful and you know he is wealthy and he's calm and he greets you and he smiles and he reaches out to you and he's not arrogant. That is the best person. You know the hadith says the people going into Jannah, the Prophet ﷺ was asked the question, what are the characters and features of those who will enter Jannah? He said two things, Taqwa Allahi wa husnul khuluqi. Two reasons that people will go into Jannah. Consciousness of Allah and good character. One narration says that with your good character and conduct, you can reach the level of the pious and those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of your character and conduct. That's why I've always repeated my brothers and sisters, the pious who are really close to Allah, their character shines. It shines. They are wonderful people, beautiful, pleasant to talk to. They respect. It is a sign of closeness to Allah. When you are close to Allah, you are softened. You are not hard. You are not harsh. If someone comes to you and they are harsh, they are not close to Allah. That's just hypocrisy. That's just a show. It's, it's not closeness to Allah. Closeness to Allah is depicted by being kind to people. It's the mercy of Allah. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ Indeed, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is solely by the mercy of Allah that you are lenient. You are lenient towards the people around you. The rest of the verse, Allah says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكِ If you were hard-hearted and harsh, they would have dispersed from around you. No one would want to listen to you because of your hard-heartedness, your harshness. It shows us that the characteristics of a true believer, calm, lenient, benevolent, kind at all times. That is a sign of piety. Sometimes we have people who read salah five times a day in the first saf. Sometimes you have a, a, a female, maybe a sister, reading a lot of Quran. And you know, she reads Quran, the children are watching, everyone is watching. She, perhaps she may be on a very high level according to her. Because she's doing her salat, she's reading her Quran, she dresses appropriately, everything else. Same applies to a man. Sometimes, you know, you see him outwardly very pious. But if their character is not up to standard, they are not pious. They are not pious. That's why ask yourself, how's my character? A sign of the acceptance of your deeds is that it shows in your character and your conduct. The two go hand to hand. When someone is hard and harsh, wallahi, they are not close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They cannot be. And this is why 
Some people are surprised. They say, but you know, I know this man reads a lot of salah. Okay, he has a temper. Okay, he swears now and again. Okay, he does this and that. No. All that salah, the reward of it is going to go to someone else. The hadith says, Atadruna manil muflis. Do you know who is? Do you know who is a bankrupt person? So the companion said, yes, it is a person who doesn't have the coins, dirham and dinar. The Prophet ﷺ says, no, that's not the bankruptcy that I am referring to. But a bankrupt person is he or she who will come on the day of judgment with a lot of good deeds. A lot of good deeds. Oh, oh, how are they bankrupt? But... They cheated this one, they backbit this one, they deceived this one, they abused that one, they ate the wealth of that one. So their good deeds will be paid as a payment to all of those people because the currency in the Akhirah is known as deeds. The currency in Malaysia is known as a ringgit. I cannot bring a Zimbabwe dollar and use it here. It won't work. The same way I cannot go and take my US dollars and say, ah, Oh Allah, I'll pay you 90,000. It's fine. Give it to him. It's, I, I'm so sorry. There is nothing like that. It's your deeds. That's the only thing you go with. So you pay in that currency. How many salat do you have? Give us 20,000 salat of yours. You have to owe it to this man because you harmed him. How much zakat did you give? Okay, give us X amount of your zakat. You have to owe it to this sister because you harmed her. You went for hajj. We need the reward of that hajj because you ate the wealth of this person. That's, that's the akhirah. That is the justice system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be careful of the system because... On that day, Allah says, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ That day, when your wealth and your children will not avail you, they won't help you in any way. The only thing that will help you is a heart that is pure and clean that will help you so my brothers and sisters clean your heart keep it pure rid it of jealousy hatred envy all that throw it away it's not for us we are believers we are worried about our jannah we cannot afford to have a dirty heart we have to have a clean heart good we have to try our best to be kind to the people reach out to one another have a good feeling for people have a good feeling for people. Remember, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, none of you are true believers until and unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. I want goodness. I don't want to be deceived. I want kindness. I would love to live. Subhanallah. So let others live as well. Be kind to them as well. Honor them. Respect them, give them dignity. See what Allah will do to you. There was once a Sahabi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from among those with a clean heart. Amen. There was once a Sahabi. The Prophet says, You want to see a person from Jannah? Look at that man. Anyway, he walked off. Someone followed him. And they asked him, Hey, the Prophet said that you are a man from Jannah. What is it that you do? What's your extra deed? There must be some extra thing that you have. What is it? Ah, he's thinking. He says, nothing. I just do my farad. Imagine I just do my farad. There's no extra deed spoken about. He did not get up for tahajjud as well. He just did his farad. He's compulsory. And he said, oh, there's one thing. Every night before I sleep, I make sure that in my heart there is no hatred or ill feeling for any other mu'mineen. I remove it completely, then I sleep. That was the quality. You want Jannah? Take out hatred, ill feeling from your heart. You will get the Jannah to fill those. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ was asked a question about a woman. She prays and she fasts and she is charity and whatever else, but she harms her neighbor. You know what he said? It was a very, very serious response. He said, she is in hell. Wow. But she prays and she fasts. But she harms her neighbor. She is in hell. Oh, that was hard. It was tough because it, we needed to think about it. And then he was asked that there is another woman. She just does her basics. You know, basic meaning farad. Because remember my brother's sisters, farad, we cannot compromise. That which is compulsory, we don't compromise. More than that, 
It's up to you to get close to Allah through that. Subhanallah. So, this lady doesn't do too much extra, but she does not harm her neighbor. The Prophet ﷺ says, she is in Jannah. Wow. These were prophecies. Why? To show you that to harm people is dangerous. You need to be kind. Now, as we progress, we will notice that in life, we are going to see the underprivileged. We will see the disabled. We will see those who don't have children. We will see those who don't have parents, known as orphans. We will see those who have lost their husbands, known as widows. What is your treatment towards these? I want to remind you by asking you a question. Who was the best of creation? Can you say a name? Say it loudly. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Guess what? He was an orphan. He was an orphan. He was an orphan. His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was still a child. He was looked after by his grandfather. The grandfather passed away two years after that. And after that, he was looked after by his uncle for several years. Subhanallah. He was an orphan. Why did Allah choose for the best of creation, the one him whom he loved the most, to be an orphan? And still give him the greatest success to be a comfort to the rest of the orphans and to raise the rank and the honor of the orphans to say, if you are an orphan, it does not mean that Allah does not like you. Perhaps he loves you more. Many people, they lose their parents. They say, maybe Allah does not love us. Look what he did to us. No. My brothers and sisters, when you suffer a loss, when you've lost something, when you are sick and ill, when something bad has happened according to you, it is not necessarily a sign that Allah is upset with you. It is not necessarily a punishment from Allah. It depends on your conviction and your closeness to Allah. If you are content, then it's the mercy of Allah. If it brought you close to Allah even a little bit, then it's the mercy of Allah. But if your problem drove you to the club and to the bar and you started drinking and you went on to drugs, then it was a punishment. You following what I'm saying? We are mu'mineen. When we suffer a loss and a sickness, what do we do? We read extra two rakaat, right? We call out to Allah, oh Allah, I have a problem. Maybe you did not call out to Allah before that. But Allah loves you so much, He gave you the problem. When he gave it to you, you came to him. Allah says, you see, I love you. I know how to bring you to me. I know what to do to you. I just give you, the doctor made a mistake, wrong diagnosis. So between the one test and the second test, you did not know that this test result was wrong. You became so close to me. Subhanallah. Our problem is when we find out the next test that we are not sick, we go back to our old ways, forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what happens to us. So what does Allah do? He keeps you sick sometimes. Because if He keeps you sick, He keeps you at a loss. He keeps you in a disadvantaged position according to the worldly life. So that you are humble. You still fulfill your salah. How many of us, we changed our lives because someone close to us passed away. May Allah give them Jannah to Firdaus. How many of us we became close to Allah after that. That was the mercy of Allah. Allah loves you. Don't think of it as bad. So I was saying the Prophet ﷺ was an orphan. Hence, he says very clearly that when you take care of an orphan, you will be resurrected with me. With me. What's the common point? Why me? Why did he say, Ana wa kafilul yatimi kahatayni fil jannah? Why did he say, Myself and the one who takes care of an orphan shall be like these two fingers in jannah? Why did he show these two fingers together? Because he was an orphan himself. The rank he has, if you took care of someone who was an orphan, it means you have taken care of someone who has been through similar situation to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have honored this particular child. You've given them opportunities. Many a time in our lives, when you see an orphan, people stay far. And this orphan is now wasted. No education, no proper upbringing, no nothing. What happens? They are on the street. Change that. 
You have to go out, reach out to an orphan. In Islam, we honor that orphan. You know what the hadith says? When you stroke, when you caress the head of an orphan, your sins are forgiven. Subhanallah. How come so much of importance? I tell you, Muhammad sallallahu was an orphan. Show kindness. Be compassionate. Subhanallah. When someone passes away, you need to make dua for them. You need to seek that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Allah, that Allah gives them Jannatul Firdaus, no matter who they were. Rahmatullahi alayhim, rahimahullah. May Allah grant them mercy. May Allah have mercy on them. And it is only normal and natural that if they were closer to you, you might cry. It's normal. It's okay. Crying is very good. To be honest with you, crying is a way to deal with your emotions. And it actually helps you sometimes. I'm not saying crying for nothing. No reason. You know, sometimes food is burnt, you start crying. No, no, no. Relax. Don't worry about that. We don't cry for small reasons. You know, they say there was a, a man and he was uh, getting married to someone. And he was a very soft person. So they say, his friends told him, you know, you are too soft. You are too soft. We are, we are really fearful of what's going to happen to you after you marry, you know. There's going to be absolute control. So he said, oh, so what's the solution? The solution is, they said the first day, the first day when you get married, we will leave a cat in your room and, and a big baton behind the curtain. So as you enter this room and your wife is there, when the cat comes out, you beat that cat. So anyway, he came out. And the cat came out and his bride is there. And his bride knew from her friends, ah, this guy is too soft. You are so fortunate. You are so lucky, you know. So as the cat came, this man started hitting and he, he was really serious. Anyway, the cat ran away. There was one narration that I stated many years ago that the cat died, but now we, we, we will be a little bit more merciful. Let's say it didn't die, okay? So after that, she was worried. This man is so energetic. He's ruthless. He's brutal. Now when he says things, she listens quickly because she knows there's going to be a problem. So for example, he says, you know what? You'd better get my tea ready. Otherwise, so she, she doesn't want to hear otherwise what? She quickly says, okay, okay, okay. She runs, she'll quickly do this. Make the water hot or else, or else, or else. Oh, she quickly ran away. According to her, that means there's going to be drama, isn't it? So it happened a few times. Then she met her friend. She said, you know, you guys were predicting wrong. This guy is actually brutal. You know, this is what happened. They said, no, 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 no. Call his bluff. No, call the bluff. So the next day, when he says, I want my breakfast to be ready here by 8 o'clock. You better make my breakfast or else. So she says, or else what? He got a shock. He looked at her. He says, or else I will make it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah grant us ease. It's the softness of the heart. Your predominant nature always shows. It always shows. Some people, they are soft at heart. They are kind at heart. That's predominant. It's prevalent. It will show always. Some people are ruthless. No matter how hard they try to be sweet, it always shows. We need to work hard. If you have a bad habit, like I said right at the beginning of this talk, when you have a bad habit, ask Allah to help you. And work hard to eradicate it. Without working hard, it's not just going to go away on its own. You have to work very hard. So anyway, my brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ had a son. His name was Ibrahim. And what happened is something very strange. Also, Allah wanted to show us something. Muhammad sallallahu lost the child. How did he lose the child? You know the Arabs at the time, 
They used to send their children out into the desert in order to be brought up in that natural air and suckled by a foster mom. So like Halimatu Sadiya took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was young. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave his son Ibrahim to some people. The man was a blacksmith. Blacksmith meaning, you know, he used to blow into the iron ore, a lot of smoke coming out and so on. So as a result, perhaps as a result, this child developed a respiratory disease and the child passed away. When the child was passing away, the last few breaths, Muhammad was there and he carried his child. And the child was suffocating and passed away. So tears rolled down the eyes of Rasulullah Tears rolled down his eyes, meaning his cheeks. So the Sahaba عنهم, were surprised because you know you talk of taqdeer. Taqdeer means good and bad fate is from Allah. You need to be strong. You need to be strong. But my brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ himself shed tears. They looked at him. Oh messenger, you are crying. He says, إِنَّمَا هِيَ رَحْمَةٌ جَعَلَهَا اللَّهُ فِي عِبَادِهِ الرُّحَمَةِ He says, these tears are actually mercy that Allah has placed in his slaves who have mercy. If you have mercy, you will cry. So when you see things, when someone passes away, I was saying that was the point that you cry. It's okay. If the Prophet ﷺ cried, remember it cannot be something that is totally wrong. No. You cry. You don't wail. You don't scream and shout and start tearing your clothes. That's not for a moment. No. But what you do, you can cry. Make dua. Do something good. Try and help the deceased through the ways that were taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And inshallah you will see, it will give you comfort too. When a woman loses her husband, she's known as a widow. Her rank is higher than an ordinary woman. Remember this. Why? Because Allah took away from her the male figure. Widow. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, the one who spends his time serving the orphans and widows is equal in reward to the one who stands in prayer throughout the night and who fasts during the day. Subhanallah. Widows and orphans. It's not only about orphans, it's about the widows too. Like I said, the rank of a widow is very high in terms of the reward that we would achieve if we were to serve them. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we serve a widow, it should never be with an ulterior motive. You know, sometimes you find the men, and this is happening more and more on the globe in so many communities where you have someone, they see there is a widow, she is in need. They help her not for the sake of Allah, but for the sake of their own play and pastime. They want to blackmail, they want to cheat, they want to lure, they want to seize the opportunity of the need of this person to fulfill their own haram desire. That is absolutely unacceptable. It is sinful behavior. The reward goes to the one who helps for the sake of Allah. You can help without even people knowing it was you. That's a good way of doing it. No one needs to know. The hadith says, when you give as a believer, the best charity is that which your left hand does not know what your right hand did. That's the best charity. Subhanallah. Because you know that's for the sake of Allah. I just gave it and it's fine, I'm going. I owed it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the widows, we need to be kind. We need to reach out to them. Do something for them. Help them with a little project, a business thing. Perhaps sometimes some tuck shop they can run. Or maybe a sewing project. Or you can help them by giving them a job. And that job needs to be with utmost respect. This is reaching out to people. Then we have another category of people whom we as Muslimin reach out to. The needy. 
The needy are a gift from Allah. Had they not been there, who would you have given your charity to? The hadith says one of the signs of Qiyamah is there will come a time when there will be no people who will accept zakat. Everyone will be rich. You know, one day I was mentioning these signs of Qiyamah. So I spoke about this and I said the hadith says, you know, wealth will be so much that everyone will be rich. No one will accept zakat. You want to give your money, they'll say, hey, who are you giving? Imagine going to a wealthy man and you didn't know he's wealthy. You say, I've got some zakat. He said, what? I've got zakat. What you, you have giving me the zakat? You know? So anyway, I gave this narration. One young boy put up his hand. So I thought, what's going on? I said, yes, what would you like? He says, when is that time going to come? Why? Because he's thinking, if everyone's going to be rich, I'd rather be... I said, brother, that's a sign of Qiyamah. It's actually a sign of the end of times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. It will come with a different fitna. It will come with another problem. Because you know, when everyone is wealthy and everyone is powerful, it becomes a competition according to the Qur'an. It becomes a competition. You want to hear the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it? اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وله وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد. Allah gives the example and Allah says you should know that the life of this world. These are the various stages. Hayatu dunya. You should know the life of this world is la'ibun wa lahwun wa zinatun. La'ibun wa lahwun wa zinatun. That is how it starts. If you know Arabic, you will know that the word la'ib means to play. The word lahu is amusement, slightly more sophisticated than play. Why? Because you are now older. When you are born, you play. You have a game, you have a rattle. When a child is born, you can take a little rattle and you just make the sound, you know. Ch -ch 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 -ch. And the child is so excited. He -he. Why? I know I've got eight children of my own, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. I promise you, the child is so excited. That is life. They are playing, playing with you. But when the child gets two years old, three years old, no, I need a car now. It must be a car. You can't just do this to me. You do this, they will throw it away. Cannot do that. So from life, it becomes lahu. At a certain age, they want remote control helicopter. Have you seen it? They want to fly it without them. Now they want the iPhone. If you don't give the phone, there is a tantrum in the house. I promise you, they have to have your phone. And nowadays, the kids know how to take better selfies than you and me. <laughs> Subhanallah. I promise you, a few minutes ago, we were with the brothers. And we were taking a selfie. Now I have a habit sometimes when someone is taking a picture, if I know something, I'll teach them, I'll tell them. So I say, you know, when you take a selfie, make sure you wipe the front camera before you take your selfie every time. It enhances the image by 50%. <laughs> Why? Because we speak with the phone. I'm honest, I'm teaching you something. Maybe you might want to pay me when I'm going away because it's worth money. We speak on the phone, the ear and this region where the hair is, it's sweaty. There's a bit of grease sometimes there, grime. So the phone normally has a little bit of sweat in the front. And we just take a selfie, not thinking that you, you didn't wipe this, come on. Every time I look at a screen, I've looked at so many of these screens, I can actually tell you, brother, you just need to wipe your camera. They look at me, what? What? I'm honest with you, wipe it, wipe it and you see a beautiful image come out, subhanallah. Anyway, we learned something tonight, inshallah. I promise you, when you now wipe it, you think of me, make a dua for me, inshallah. So you wipe the front camera and then you take the picture. The kids already know this, subhanallah. They know about a selfie stick because they are short and small. They have the phone ready and it's done. And I promise you that is lahu. It is laibun and then it goes to lahu. They want to play with your phone. They want to make sure they know the code. You know, they know that this is your code. That's what it is. If it's your finger, they say, no, put the finger. Finger, put the finger. Subhanallah, put your finger. Well, now you have kids mode. But then they, they know that, that. This is no, this is not what you do. 
These are the children. The point I'm raising to for you is to show you that when Allah spoke about it in the Quran, Allah says the stages of life. It starts off with lahib, it goes to lahu. Now it's lahu up to what age? Ah, you get to the early teens, maybe nine, ten, before, just before your teens. Then it becomes zina. To what is zina? Now I need to check my hair, you know, and make sure I'm okay. Put my glasses. Put my Nice shoes, I'm walking out, I smell nice, have my buttons open, my everything well, I must walk down. Because now it's no longer just lahu and lie. When you were a child, your mother used to give you clothing. As you grew older, you were worried about toys and things. Now you're a little bit older, you're worried, hey, mom says, wear this. No, 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 I'm not wearing that. You can give it away. I want to wear this and this and this, you know. If it doesn't say, boss, here, yeah, I'm not going to wear it. So it becomes zina. You become a person up to the time you get married. And even slightly beyond, it's all about zinatun, you know, beautification. We are beautifying ourselves. We are beautifying, making sure that everything is prim and prop. We want to draw the attention of those around us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it in a good way and not in a bad way. So, zinatun. After that, what happens? You get your job. You, you now graduate from school, you get your job. Tafakhur. Tafakhurun bayinakum. Tafakhur. You start compete. You start. Tafakhur actually means to compete with one another. Who is. Who has more. You are boasting. Tafakhurun. Tafakhur is. You are boasting. What are you boasting about? You are bragging. Subhanallah. I'm bragging. Bragging about what I have. What I earned. Where I work. What I do. Look at my car. Look at my house. Look at this. Look at that. Tafakhur. Now what happens? There comes a stage when you have your children. You have your car. You have your house. You now are amassing. Amassing means what you're getting. You're building. You're getting more and more. So Allah says, تَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Two things. After tafakhur, you start amassing your wealth and your children. Two things. That's why when old man, when he introduced himself, what does he say? I've got four grandchildren. I've got 17 grandchildren. So what is he doing? He won't stop there. He will tell you three are doctors. Four are lawyers, two are politicians, one is a CEO of that company. What is he doing to you? He's just tafakhur. He's just, you know, he is talking about his wealth and his children. That's it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, you see, all of this here, there comes a stage when a person has so much of wealth, so much of children, it becomes a competition with one another. That's what it is. Because the words used in the Quran are actually referring to that which happens to more than one. You know, when, when someone says, uh, when we use the term to argue, you argue with more than one. So we say, khasama. Khasama. We argued, it's more than one. It's not just khasm. Khasm is one person. But khasama is when you are when there are more than one person when you say taqabala you're talking of two people so that's why allah says tafakhara notice it's the same weight in the arabic language those who know the language but let me not make it too complicated for you because it will become boring rather i tell you that there comes a stage when we compete with each other without realizing we're going closer to the grave now we're going closer to the grave there comes a time when People become ugly because they have too much. Absolutely too much. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Had I given everyone wealth, men would have been fighting each other and they would have actually sought the blood of one another. If everyone was wealthy, there would have been chaos on earth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, some are wealthy, some are not. Some are in need and so on and so forth. This is why when everyone has, will have wealth, it will be a sign of the end. It will be a sign of the end. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So whatever wealth you have, learn to give. When you give, 
your name is written next to it. For as long as you have not given that wealth, your name is not written next to it. Did you know that? When you've given it, used it, spent it, and it's no longer with you, your name was written next to it. This man earned it, this man spent it. Done. The circle is closed. But if you have earned it, and you have not spent it, it's not written next to your name. Because if you die there and then without spending it, whose name is written next to it? Someone else. The heirs. Your heirs will take it. Your children's name, someone else's name will be written next to it. Not yours. Because you didn't spend it. When you spent it, the circle was completed. When you did not spend it, the circle was not completed. Before it was completed, someone else's name was written next to it. They used it, they spent it. And you know what happens? When you leave too much of wealth, the chances are the children fight for that particular wealth. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, the best wealth that you can spend is that which you earned with your own perspiration. Its value in your eyes is very different from that which you just got without sweat. Although it's good, the hadith of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas anhu, he was a wealthy person and when he was on his deathbed, he says, Oh messenger, I have lots of wealth and I only have one daughter. So can, can't I give all my wealth for charity? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. He said, okay, so then can I give two thirds to charity? He said, no. He said, can I give half to charity? He said, no. So then can I give one third to charity? He says, a thuluth wa thuluthu kathir. He says, you give one third and not more than one third. One third is enough. From that... We actually have a ruling in Islam that states that a man is not allowed to bequeath more than one third. At least two thirds needs to go to his heirs. Subhanallah, it's amazing. These are rules of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us be people who are charitable and who reach out to others through our kindness in character and conduct as well as our wealth. When we give, you know how much it grows? It grows so much. Allah says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَنْبَتَتْ سَبْعَ سَنَابِلْ فِي كُلِّ سُنْبُلَةٍ مِئَةُ حَبَّةٍ وَاللَّهُ يُضَاعِفُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءٍ Allah says the example of the one who spends in the cause of Allah is like the example of the corn. Do you know the corn, the ears of corn where they have seeds, so many seeds. It is one seed, the example of a seed that grows so many corns. And on each one you find 100 you will have seven different corns and on each one there will be 100 of those seeds subhanallah which means multiply that by 700 you spend in the path of Allah minimum return 700 fold you spend it in the dunya you buy your property you do this you invest it minimum return only Allah knows but it's not going to be 700 times Imagine I put in one ringgit, I get back 700 ringgits. I put in 700 ringgits, I get back 4900. Uh, Subhanallah. That is amazing. But it requires a believer to understand that. And you know we have a month of Ramadan. That month of Ramadan is a month of charity. It's a month of giving. It's a month of the Quran. It's a month of generosity. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says, the companions are describing him and they say, Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nas. The Prophet ﷺ was the most generous of all people. He used to give. He used to give everything. Whatever he could, he would give it away. And he would make sure that people take and people are okay and people are taken care of. Because he knew, when you give, you get. Allah will provide. So the hadith says, when I say hadith here, yeah, I'm talking of 
the hadith of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu describing Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They say, "Kana ajwad nas He was the most generous of people. Wa kana ajwad ma yakunu fi Ramadan. Hina yalqahu Jibril, fayudarisuhu al-Quran. Subhanallah. And in the narration, it says, "Kana ajwad min al-rih al-Mursala." The meaning of which is. He was the most generous in Ramadan when Jibreel alayhi salam used to come to him and they used to read the Quran to one another. He was very generous. So the Quran alone, when you recite it, it makes you generous. It makes you closer to Allah. What is the sign of being close to Allah? I said it earlier. It is that you become closer to the creatures made by the same Allah. What's the link between you and I? Whoever made me, made you. Whoever made me, made you. That's why you are my brother, you are my sister in humanity. I need to reach out to you. If you are making a mistake, if I'm making a mistake, we would expect each other to correct in a beautiful way because we are part of one broad family known as human beings. When you share one mother, one father, you are siblings. But when you share the Creator, you are brothers and sisters as well in humanity. Even if you're not a Muslim, you are still my brother and sister in humanity. We reach out to them. We are kind to them. If they are not kind to us, that does not mean we must not be kind to them. We still should be kind. The Prophet ﷺ was kind to those who harmed him. He made a dua for those who came to war with him. He prayed for those who made his blood, who made his blood hit the ground. Subhanallah. Look at what happened in Taif. When he was able and capable to do something about it, he chose not to. Because that was the kindness. That's what Islam teaches you. To have hope. To look at the positives. If I'm going to make a dua to destroy these people, they'll be destroyed. Then what? Then what? Rather I say, oh Allah, guide them. If they are guided, mashallah, we will benefit, subhanallah. We will, you know, huge benefit for the deen. That's what happened in Taif. So the Prophet ﷺ was so generous that the hadith says he was like the blowing wind. You know what is the blowing wind? When the wind blows now, all of us here will feel it. Without exception. If the wind were to blow, we will all feel it. And did it decrease it in any way? No, we all felt it. So the Prophet ﷺ's generosity was such that everyone felt it. And definitely that was not solely monetary. It was also character, conduct. Kana khuluquhul Qur'an. His character was the Qur'an. My brothers and sisters, I've spoken for a long time. One hour and 25 minutes. Do you realize that? MashaAllah. One of the longer speeches. Maybe not the longest, but it's very long. I can't recall the last time I came here. Perhaps it was a little bit shorter. But this time I'm well rested. Alhamdulillah, I feel a little bit more at home. At least I know some of the faces I recognize from the last time. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah grant you goodness and ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala develop us. And may we try our best to develop ourselves by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep on calling out to Allah. Pray to Allah. And remember that a sign of the acceptance of your prayer is when you become humble. When you are people who reach out to one another. This is why the verses I read at the beginning here were describing at the end of Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was describing the, the qualities of the worshippers of Ar-Rahman, his worshippers. And one of the things he starts off by saying, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا The true worshippers of Allah, when they walk on the earth, they walk with humility. They are humble. They are not arrogant. You know, sometimes a person walks so arrogantly that if he were to trip, everybody would laugh. 
You know they say when you are too high, when you fall, you get hurt. But when you are low, you fall, you don't really get hurt much because you were low anyway. So be careful. We need to understand. Be humble. Allah says when you are a true worshipper, you are walk with humbleness and humility. You are very humble and you walk with humility. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And the last thing that I want to say is the second part of that where Allah says, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا It is so beautifully worded. When the ignorant address the true worshippers, then the true worshippers just say peace and they walk away without engaging them. If someone is ignorant, don't waste your time talking to them. If they have a bad intention and you can see they are foul mouth, in order to convince them, you might have to become foul mouth as well. So don't waste your time. Salama, that means peace, you walk away. Don't make war with them, make peace with them. Smile at them. Again, it's happened to me and I've encouraged a lot of people to do this. Sometimes you have a person screaming, yelling, looking at you. Just look at them. Just smile. They look at you like, and then they have to go away. They have no option. Sometimes they start laughing. They say, you mad. I had someone once on the road, we were driving. And for some reason, the person felt that I cut them up. So they were so upset when we got to the traffic light, bah, 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 screaming. And my window was up and screaming and shouting and pointing and whatever else. And I just looked at them. They just looked at me and said, they went away. What else? If I, a lot of people today, they don't do that. They will put the window down and start swearing back. In South Africa, they take out guns. They even shoot. I promise you, out of something minor, small things, people are dead. You can read about it. It's a dangerous place, subhanallah. So this is why we say, if you know how to react to those who are ignorant, there won't be any more problems. That verse also means that when someone is creating a problem, make sure you resolve it in a way. Make sure you deal with it in a way that does not create a bigger problem. If someone swears you, by swearing them back, what are you going to gain? What are you going to gain? You might, it might escalate into something huge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May Allah grant us goodness and ease. Once again, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every one of you, to bless your nation, to grant you goodness. Everyone who is going through difficulty in whatever way they are going through it, Allah knows what is happening to you. May Allah grant you ease in whatever you are going through. Amen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bestow upon you His mercy. May Allah take care of you. May Allah grant us all Jannatul Firdaus the day that we leave. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Iqra' كتاب الله ترقى جنانه وتنى العظيم الأجر والغفران رتله روي القلب من نفحاته كالماء يروي لهفة العطشان